Missing the truck leaves residents unable to, to dispose of their garbage, a dire consequence on this semi-tropical island with robust cockroach and rat populations. Polish composer Barazuska's piano piece, The Maiden's Prayer, or Xiaonu de Qi Dao, which was first published in 1856, has been the dominant melody since musical garbage trucks were introduced from Japan in 1968. In recent decades, Beethoven's for release also established itself in the garbage truck repertoire. Here, I focus on garbage truck music as a sonic irritant and as a component in Taiwan's successful household waste reduction schemes. As an irritant, garbage truck tunes remind citizens of the necessity of managing waste, both at the personal level, as in removing trash from one's home, and the island and even global levels. From the 1990s onward, newspaper reports and expressions found in a variety of cultural products show that the garbage pickup routine and the music that is central to it had begun to signal to some citizens environmental degradation on a large, almost unimaginable scale. In theorizing that the near constant presence of the Maiden's Prayer in the lives of Taiwan residents has contributed to a strong awareness of environmental degradation, I employ several theoretical concepts current in the eco-critical literature. Um, due to time constraints here today, I focus on Nixon's concept of slow violence. For Nixon, slow violence unfolds gradually and largely out of sight. Slow violence is, quote, neither spectacular nor instantaneous, but rather incremental and accretive, its calamitous repercussions playing out across a range of temporal scales, end quote. Climate change, the radioactive aftermath of wars, and deforestation are a few of Nixon's examples. To these, I add contamination of water sources and the omnipresence of environmental plastics. One of the challenges in combating low, slow violence is gaining and keeping attention focused on the unfolding calamity. The long emergencies of slow violence are not immediately spectacular, and their causes are often not immediately or undeniably obvious. As early as February 1970, a political column in the Lianhe Bao voiced concerns over the placement of a landfill in proximity to the Xingdian River, which is near the source of Taipei's water supply. The column touted garbage trucks broadcasting the Maiden's Prayer and sanitation workers cleaning the streets as illustrations of a functioning municipality in a modern nation. It warned, however, quote, once the water is polluted, everyone's health in Taipei will be affected, end quote. This example pro provides early evidence of a conceptual linkage between garbage, its daily musical collection, and the slow violence of water supply contamination. One of the keys to Taiwan's success in the reduction of household waste is that the garbage collection routine, with its familiar and almost omnipresent music, never allows the issue of waste to recede too far from people's minds. This paper argues that the everyday management of, with waste collection and the engagement with waste collection, particularly orally through garbage truck music, has heightened awareness of larger issues of environmental degradation and is in part responsible for Taiwan's laudable success in not only reducing household waste, but also creating the conditions that have earned Taiwan the designation an island of green in Asia. The story of how garbage truck music helped Taiwan achieve one of the world's highest recycling rates requires an overview of music's role in trash collection policies and practices over the last half century. I don't have time to go over 50 years today, so I'm just going to mention a few key developments and I'm focusing on policies and practices in Taipei City. So Taipei imported its musical garbage trucks from Japan. They were put into service in January, 1968. And um, the trucks arrived in Taiwan 
with tape players installed and the Maiden's Prayer preloaded on their tapes. And unfortunately, this film footage that I'm showing is silent, but it was a big deal for these trucks to, to be imported and put to use. As I leap forward through this history, suffice to say that frustrations with garbage pickup uh, were reported in newspapers from time to time, particularly beginning in the early 1980s. The idea that garbage truck music represented a sonic irritant gained increasing attention throughout 1983. In a meeting of the Taipei City Police and Sanitation Committee in November 1983, City Councilman Chen Yi Rong claimed that citizens were finding the constant presence of the Maiden's Prayer hard to bear. He estimated that sanitation workers probably heard the endlessly repeating tune 10,000 times in a single month. Every citizen likely encountered it 10 times a day as the trucks wove their way through the capital city's streets and alleys. Chen asserted, quote, people were fed up with hearing the Maiden's Prayer every day, end quote. A survey conducted by our keynote speaker today, sociologist Xing Huang Michael Xiao, in 1983, around the time of Councilman Chen lodged his complaint, he found that in general, the people of Taiwan were, quote, rather pessimistic about environmental conditions, end quote. A follow-up survey conducted in 1986 found that over the intervening three years, the public had become increasingly aware of environmental issues. In fact, by 1986, the growing consciousness and awareness of the deterioration of the physical environment had, according to Xiao, quote, reached the level where people in Taiwan were essentially ranking environmental problems at the top of social problems facing society, end quote. The idea of garbage as an indicator of greater environmental degradation was expressed for the first time in popular music in 1984 with the release of Luo Da Yo's song Super Citizens. In Super Citizens, Luo sings of sitting on the banks of the Danshui River watching Taipei's garbage drift past, echoing growing protests against burning garbage in landfills and making note of the ever-increasing amounts of waste, Law sarcastically intones, quote, thick smoke blowing from the distance, the garbage mountain has launched a firework celebration, and we cheer. Dear citizens of Taipei, flourishing Taipei City, there will always be more garbage to burn, end quote. And we'll take a quick listen to this. <laughs> Kind of image of what he's talking about. This was um, the landfill in Sanchong looking across to Taipei City. In the mid 1980s, Taipei City residents were finally freed from the tyranny of the Maiden's Prayer and the exhausting practice of chasing after garbage trucks. Following the new scheme, beginning in February 1985, citizens dumped their trash at designated spots between 9 and 11 p.m. For the next six years, trucks moved through the city from 11 p.m. until early morning, picking up garbage in relative silence. Even this new scheme quickly began to cause headaches. Not long after it was implemented, some people started depositing their trash outside the designated hours, and some citizens did not properly wait, wrap their waste products. Disputes over dumping habits led to arguments between neighbors. Besides these human failings, stray cats and dogs sometimes broke open bags and would strew their contents far and wide. All of this drew the interest of insects and rats. On hot days, the liquid leaked by the marinating garbage stank long after the trucks picked up the garbage. In early 1995, the Taipei City Department of Environmental Protection surveyed all of the city's neighborhood leaders and found that 70% wanted to abandon the nighttime drop-off scheme. 
DEP Director Chen Jingyang said that the system had been a complete failure. In 1996, the old systems of trucks playing the maiden's prayer to call residents to dump their trash was reintroduced. As in the years before 1985, residents were once again on alert as they strained to hear the sounds of the maiden calling. As soon as her prayer drifted in from that, the, the distance, they needed to gather their trash and head post haste to the predetermined locations where the truck would stop for 10 or so minutes before moving on to the next destination. Familiar complaints about the inconvenience of chasing the garbage trucks reverberated once more, this time in all forms of media, many forms of media, including popular song and film, and newspapers once again abounded with colorful descriptions of chasing the garbage truck. Circling back to the question of how the presence of garbage truck music and the anxiety it produces in the daily lives of Taiwan citizens links to broader concerns over environmental degradation, I turn, turn to a humorlessly hyperbolic article penned by essay, essayist Chen Huang and published in the Liang Bao in May 1993. In it, Chen depicts the travails he and his news, uh, neighbors experienced in their efforts to chase garbage trucks in the days shortly after his communi community moved uh, to the Lusa Bu Luo Di, or garbage not touching the ground scheme. He says that with this change, quote, everyone jams their garbage into their homes, listening intently in all directions. They sit straining to hear the sound of the truck's music because the garbage truck doesn't wait for anyone or for garbage, end quote. And Chen's narrative includes the tragic story of a nearby elderly woman who tumbled as she raced down five flights of stairs carrying heavy bags of garbage in an effort to meet the truck. She broke several ribs and nearly lost her life. Chen also reports on a war veteran who stumbled and broke a tooth in his race to the truck one rainy evening. Dripping met wet with his mouth contorted, he exclaimed to Chen, and sorry, this is a good translation, aw, fuck. I don't think I was ever this exhausted back in the days when I was killing communists, and I sure, surely never lost half a tooth to a bullet. So, end quote. Following these colorful depictions, Chen closes with a tone of resignation. Quote, I don't understand why dumping the garbage must exhaust people and their resources. This is the sorrow of contemporary people's lives. And every citizen, or as every city considers how to manage the huge headache of garbage whose mass swells day by day, average citizens have their energy depleted in their efforts to dump their garbage. Garbage, it's the greatest enemy of 20th century humans. Humans' ability to produce garbage far outstrips its ability to eliminate it. Its scopes ranges from nuclear waste to cigarette butts. It's truly, truly multifarious. You can't help but sigh in awe, a long quote from Chen Huang. So Chen links everyday household waste to all manners of waste, including nuclear waste and everything in between. And um, he expresses this anxiety around listening for the maiden's prayer. And these kinds of anxieties and linkages to other kinds of waste are, are sometimes um, found in, multi in popular song. And I'm going to um, quickly look at one song by um, Chen Jianwei. It's his 2013 song called Garbage People. I'm gonna skip that one, okay. In this image taken from the song's animated music video, we see garbage trucks pulling up to a garbage mountain. Look carefully and you will find um, barrels of radioactive waste near the mountain's top. This work therefore links the collection of household waste to the larger environmental issues, I see you, of um, nuclear waste. Furthermore, the song's main melody is built around a fragment of Beethoven's for release, thus musically tying this calamitous pile of waste to the soundscape of everyday trash collection. And um, if you can read music notation, great. It's really fast. You'll hear the sound of for release in this tune's main melody. I'm gonna 
半色呀，唔见那边。Did you catch it? It's very fast.、Um, the frequent sounding of garbage truck music across the island focuses listeners' minds, if only for a moment, on the multifarious conundrums presented by waste. Unlike many forms of slow violence, which quote remain imperceptible to the senses end quote in many places around the globe, the immediate physicality of Taiwan's garbage collection routine does not allow for the long emergency of waste disposal to drift too far from the public's imagination. Taiwan currently boasts one of the world's most efficient recycling systems. As Lai Yingying, head of, or former head of Taiwan's Environmental Protection Administration Waste Management Office, observed, for waste reduction policies to work, quote, you need waste disposal to sit firmly in the public's consciousness. It's what makes a circular circular economy actually happen. End quote. Garbage truck music has worked over many decades to make waste disposal sit firmly in people's minds. Taiwan's unique system for trash removal, the high degree to which garbage has permeated the island's expressive culture and general environmental awareness, have all contributed to a sense of stewardship and care for the commons that positions Taiwan as one of the world's leaders in reduction of household waste. And thank you very much for your attention. Here, I focus on garbage truck music as a sonic irritant and as a component in Taiwan's successful household waste reduction schemes. As an irritant, garbage truck tunes remind citizens of the necessity of managing waste, both at the personal level, as in removing trash from one's home, and the island and even global levels. From the 1990s onward. Newspaper reports and expressions found in a variety of cultural products show that the garbage pickup routine and the music that is central to it had begun to signal to some citizens environmental degradation on a large, almost unimaginable scale. In theorizing that the near constant presence of the Maiden's Prayer in the lives of Taiwan residents has contributed to a strong Awareness of environmental degradation. I employ several theoretical concepts current in the eco-critical literature.、Um, due to time constraints here today, I focus on Nixon's concept of slow violence. For Nixon, slow violence unfolds gradually and largely out of sight. Slow violence is quote neither spectacular nor instantaneous, but rather incremental and accretive. Its calamitous repercussions playing out across a range of temporal scales. End quote. Climate change, the radioactive aftermath of wars, and deforestation are a few of Nixon's examples. To these, I add contamination of water sources and the omnipresence of environmental plastics. One of the challenges in combating low, slow violence is gaining and keeping attention focused on the unfolding calamity. The long emergencies of slow violence are not immediately spectacular, and their causes are often not immediately or undeniably obvious. As early as February 1970, a political co column in the Lianhe Bao. Voiced concerns over the placement of a landfill in proximity to the Xingdian River, which is near the source of Taipei's water supply. The column touted garbage trucks broadcasting the Maiden's Prayer and sanitation workers cleaning the streets as illustrations of a functioning municipality in a modern nation. It warned, however, quote, "Once the water is polluted, everyone's health in Taipei will be affected." End quote. This example prov provides early evidence of a conceptual linkage between garbage, its daily musical collection, and the slow violence of water supply contamination. One of the keys to Taiwan's success in the reduction of household waste is that the garbage collection routine, with its familiar and almost omnipresent music, never allows the issue of waste to recede too far from people's minds. This paper argues that the everyday management、uh, with waste collection 
and the engagement with waste collection, particularly orally through garbage truck music, has heightened awareness of larger issues of environmental degradation and is in part responsible for Taiwan's laudable success in not only reducing household waste, but also creating the conditions that have earned Taiwan the designation an island of green in Asia. The story of how garbage truck music helped Taiwan achieve one of the world's highest recycling rates requires an overview of music's role in trash collection policies and practices over the last half century. I don't have time to go over 50 years today, so I'm just going to mention a few key developments and I'm focusing on policies and practices in Taipei City. So Taipei imported its musical garbage trucks from Japan. They were put into service in January 1968 and um, the trucks arrived in Taiwan with tape players installed and the Maiden's Prayer preloaded on their tapes. And unfortunately, this film footage that I'm showing is silent, but it was a big deal for these trucks to, to be imported and put to use. As I leap forward through this history, suffice to say that frustrations with garbage pickup uh, were reported in newspapers from time to time, particularly beginning in the early 1980s. The idea that garbage truck music represented a sonic irritant gained increasing attention throughout 1983. In a meeting of the Taipei City Police and Sanitation Committee in November 1983, City Councilman Chen Yi Rong claimed that citizens were finding the constant presence of the Maiden's Prayer hard to bear. He estimated that sanitation workers probably heard the endlessly repeating tune 10,000 times in a single month. Every citizen likely encountered it 10 times a day as the trucks wove their way through the capital city's streets and alleys. Chen asserted, quote, people were fed up with hearing the Maiden's Prayer every day, end quote. A survey conducted by our keynote speaker today, sociologist Xing Huang Michael Xiao, in 1983, around the time of Councilman Chen lodged his complaint, he found that in general, the people of Taiwan were, quote, rather pessimistic about environmental conditions, end quote. A follow-up survey conducted in 1986 found that over the intervening three years, the public had become increasingly aware of environmental issues. In fact, by 1986, the growing consciousness and awareness of the deterioration of the physical environment had, according to Xiao, quote, reached the level where people in Taiwan were essentially ranking environmental problems at the top of social problems facing society, end quote. The idea of garbage as an indicator of greater environmental degradation was expressed for the first time in popular music in 1984 with the release of Luo Da Yo's song Super Citizens. In Super Citizens, Luo sings of sitting on the banks of the Danshui River, watching Taipei's garbage drift past, echoing growing protests against burning garbage in landfills and making note of the ever-increasing amount of waste, Law sarcastically intones, quote, thick smoke blowing from the distance, the garbage mountain has launched a firework celebration, and we cheer. Dear citizens of Taipei, flourishing Taipei City, there will always be more garbage to burn, end quote. And we'll take a quick listen to this. And this is a kind of image of what he's talking about. This was um, the landfill in Sanchong looking across to Taipei City. In the mid-1980s, Taipei City residents were finally freed from the tyranny of the Maiden's Prayer and the exhausting practice of chasing after garbage trucks. Following the new scheme, beginning in February 1985, citizens dumped their trash at designated spots between 9 and 11 p.m. For the next six years, trucks moved through the city from 11 p.m. until early morning, picking up garbage in relative silence. Even this new scheme quickly began to cause headaches. Not long after it was implemented, some people started depositing their trash outside the designated hours, and some citizens did not properly wait, rock their waste products. Disputes over dumping habits led to arguments between neighbors. Besides these human failings, stray cats and dogs sometimes broke open bags 
and would strew their contents far and wide. All of this drew the interest of insects and rats. On hot days, the liquid leaked by the marinating garbage stank long after the trucks picked up the garbage. In early 1995, the Taipei City Department of Environmental Protection surveyed all of the city's neighborhood leaders and found that 70% wanted to abandon the nighttime drop-off scheme. DEP Director Chen Jingyang said that the system had been a complete failure. In 1996, the old systems of trucks playing the maiden's prayer to call residents to dump their trash was reintroduced. As in the years before 1985, residents were once again on alert as they strained to hear the sounds of the maiden calling. As soon as her prayer drifted in from that, the, the distance, they needed to gather their trash and head post haste to the predetermined locations where the truck would stop for 10 or so minutes before moving on to the next destination. Familiar complaints about the inconvenience of chasing the garbage trucks reverberated once more, this time in all forms of media, many forms of media, including popular song and film, and newspapers once again abounded with colorful descriptions of chasing the garbage truck. Circling back to the question of how the presence of garbage truck music and the anxiety it produces in the daily lives of Taiwan citizens links to broader concerns over environmental degradation, I turn, turn to a humorlessly hyperbolic article penned by essayist Chen Huang and published in the Lianhe Bao in May 1993. In it, Chen depicts the travails he and his news, uh, neighbors experienced in their efforts to chase garbage trucks in the days shortly after his communi community moved uh, to the Lose Bu Luo Di, or Garbage Not Touching the Ground scheme. He says that with this change, quote, everyone jams their garbage into their homes, listening intently in all directions. They sit straining to hear the sound of the truck's music because the garbage truck doesn't wait for anyone or for garbage, end quote. And Chen's narrative includes the tragic story of a nearby elderly woman who tumbled as she raced down five flights of stairs, carrying heavy bags of garbage in an effort to meet the truck. She broke several ribs and nearly lost her life. Chen also reports on a war veteran who stumbled and broke a tooth in his race to the truck one rainy evening. Dripping met wet with his mouth contorted, he exclaimed to Chen, and sorry, this is a good translation, aw, fuck. I don't think I was ever this exhausted back in the days when I was killing communists, and I sure, surely never lost half a tooth to a bullet. So, end quote. Following these colorful depictions, Chen closes with a tone of resignation, quote, I don't understand why dumping the garbage must exhaust people and their resources. This is the sorrow of contemporary people's lives. And every citizen, or as every city, co considers how to manage the huge headache of garbage, whose mass swells day by day, average citizens have their energy depleted in their efforts to dump their garbage. Garbage, it's the greatest enemy of 20th century humans. Humans' ability to produce garbage far outstrips its ability to eliminate it. Its scope ranges from nuclear waste to cigarette butts. It's truly, truly multifarious. You can't help but sigh in awe, a long quote from Chen Huang. So Chen links everyday household waste to all manners of waste, including nuclear waste and everything in between. And um, he expresses this anxiety around listening for the maiden's prayer. And these kinds of anxieties and linkages to other kinds of waste are, are sometimes um, found in, multi in popular song. And I'm going to um, quickly look at one song by um, Chen Jianwei. It's his 2013 song, called Garbage People. I'm going to skip that one. OK. In this image taken from the song's animated music video, we see garbage trucks pulling up to a garbage mountain. Look carefully, and you will find um, barrels of radioactive waste near the mountain's top. 
This work therefore links the collection of household waste to the larger environmental issues, I see you, of um, nuclear waste. Furthermore, the song's main melody is built around a fragment of Beethoven's for release, thus musically tying this calamitous pile of waste to the soundscape of everyday trash collection. And um, if you can read music notation, great. It's really fast. You'll hear the sound of for release in this tune's main melody. Did you catch it? <laughs> it's very fast. Um, the frequent sounding of garbage truck music across the island focuses listeners' minds, if only for a moment, on the multifarious conundrums presented by waste. Unlike many forms of slow violence, which, quote, remain imperceptible to the senses, end quote, in many places around the globe, the immediate physicality of Taiwan's garbage collection routine does not allow for the long emergency of waste disposal to drift too far from the public's imagination. Taiwan currently boasts one of the world's most efficient recycling systems, as Lai Yingying, head of, or former head of Taiwan's Environmental Protection Administration Waste Management Office observed, for waste reduction policies to work, quote, you need waste disposal to sit firmly in the public's consciousness. It's what makes a circular, circular economy actually happen, end quote. Garbage truck music has worked over many decades to make waste disposal sit firmly in people's minds. Taiwan's unique system for trash removal, the high degree to which garbage has permeated the island's expressive culture and general environmental awareness, have all contributed to a sense of stewardship and care for the commons that positions Taiwan as one of the world's leaders in reduction of household waste. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for our first presentation. And our next four presentations will all join us remotely. So let's switch to our online presenter, Professor Michelle from National Chinese University. OK, uh, thank you. Uh, so uh, it's nice to meet you online. And I'm Nai Xiao from Department of Public Administration, uh, National Chinese University in Taiwan. And my colleagues from the same university and department, and also the Department of Computer Science. And Professor Huang is now serving in the Institute of Information Science, Academia, uh, Academia Sinica in Taiwan. So I, I guess I will now have 12 minutes for this presentation right now. And so also, uh, let me apologize for the delayed presentation and the full paper. So, but, but actually, the slides will capture most of the the work that we are doing right now. And actually, okay. Okay. And then actually it's the a series of the research work. And the one presented here is the most updated one. It's about how the internet public opinions could be analyzed, uh, especially concerning the nuclear energy issues in Taiwan. And and now, and I guess the last work we are presenting is last year on the Academic Sinica. It's about also the same issues, but now we have adding on some uh, updated results here, okay? And as, as, as we know, the nuclear power has been an important source of energy supply in Taiwan for the past few decades. And, and whether or not we're continuing to use the, uh, the nuclear power as the energy, that the commission of the nuclear plants, which is highly technical and meanwhile very dependent and controversial actually, has significant and sustained impact in terms of benefit and risk perceptions. So the previous studies that we're doing have found that the general public believe that they are at risk, especially when the policy communications are not transparent in time. So, uh, Actually, about 90% of the people in Taiwan is now serving the internet. So uh, what they are talking about, the nuclear energy and the, the nuclear waste on the internet could be analyzed real time in terms of their sentiments and positions. And so the previous research has nevertheless indicated that 
The internet public opinion analysis remains improved concerning the extent to which the netizen set sentiments and positions correlate with each other. And more importantly, why the netizens approve or disapprove a specific public policy issues here. Um, but actually the, the sentiments and the, the, uh, the stances or the position are quite different. And one of our, uh, the, the, and the paper that we presented last year in Academia Sinica Taiwan has found that the correlation between the positions and sentiments are quite low. It's about it's below 50%. So that means when people are talking on the internet with negative sentiments, do not necessarily imply they disapprove of the issues. So this is why we are trying to go forward to the position analysis and rather than not just staying at the sentiments analysis. So the research purpose here is to just start aims to experiment with the procedure where the domain specific human coders assist the, the position analysis, a position models to analyze the internet public opinions using the NLP, natural language processing. And also we are reflect, reflecting upon the human machine collaboration. And because part of the model was coded by human coders and part of, and then we collect the internet data and train the model and then, and try to predict the, the positions of people talking on the internet. So the study attempts to, explore how the IPO analysis can be applied more reliably, especially for non-tech savvy social scientists and domain experts. So uh, here is the, the, the big pictures we are trying to get forward right now. So you can see the stage two here is the paper is doing. And then, so that, that means we try to collect the public, public opinions online and especially their set uh, they're, they're saying online and then we do the machine learning algorithms and analyze their positions. Then it's, it's mostly on stage two, but the big picture is that we are trying to go online and offline, especially in stage four, we are trying to do the hybrid deliberation and demonstrate the previous uh, sentiments or, or positions analysis results and invite offline the, the uh, stakeholders for further discussions and then we can get online again. So stage four and five, we are not doing yet for stage four and five, but this is a big picture we are doing. And the now, and the, the what I'm presenting now is mostly the results on stage one, two, and three. Okay. And then we're going to some, to some technical part here. And actually we, we try to reflect upon the public opinions, preferences, stances, and stand sentiments in a large scales. And this is what this is how we are doing about the two stage. In the first stage, you can, as you can see, we have the raw data input, and which is actually from uh, the the uh, we have a contract from the internet company, and then they collect the data in a certain period of time about the nuclear energy in Taiwan, and then we have the we arrange the human coders to code. The, the sentiments and especially the positions of the internet public opinions. So, and then we test and correct the keywords. So this is the first part. And the second part is about NLP, the natural language processing part, is we confirm the data quality, then we verify the coding and coding the labels, and then we train the models. And so the model predict the, the positions of the internet public opinions, and then we compare the results. So this is uh, this is mostly the supervised learning in the model here. Okay, and then uh, we use the BERT, the the Google based platform, to help us to pre-train the 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 model, and then uh, the totally we have five thousand about five thousand uh, entries of of data, and then. The coders we arranged is from the students or some netizens with the training sessions. Okay, so this is part, uh, part of the results here. As you can see, uh, the uh, the five thousand articles we are collecting are uh, some of the is only about uh, forty four thousand and eight hundred 
articles is relevant to the nuclear power. And then we are analyze these 4,800 4, articles to the, the positions the people are talking online. So you can see we have we found about uh, 1,600 is supporting the nuclear power. And then about 100, uh, 1,500 opposing the nuclear powers. But most important here is that we find the machines cannot properly judge the, the, uh, the, the positions the people are talking. So it's an unclear position based on the machine judgment. But actually, we do have some human judgment right now. So we can train this, we can train the model, and then we can compare the results. So this is the kind of the performance indicators for the human judgment and the machine judgment here. So um, this is like the statistics. We have type one and type two errors. And also you can actually see the human judgment of the positions online of online public opinions as the actual class or the actual judgment. This is human judgment. And the machine, the model has some predictions here. So the type one and type two error can be calculated in terms of their position, precision, record and F score here. Okay, so this is results for uh, for three layers that the human judgment and the machine judgments are compared. The first one, the, the first layer is about the relevance, which means we we judge if the opinions is about the nuclear nuclear energy or not. And you can see all the indicators uh, for the judgment is good enough. It's, it's above uh, ninety percent or even above ninety five percent. Here it's at least ninety percent. But in the layer two, the position judgment is very low. It's below 70%. And, and as far as we know, for most companies in Taiwan, they told us that uh, below the 70% the precision is not, is not good enough to be commercialized. And then we have the, th the third layer of relevance uh, is about uh, the public opinion is mentioning the nuclear waste. And the relevance taste, uh, again, the precision is very high. It's about five. It's above uh, ninety percent here right now. Okay. Now we have to. Uh, we have some discussions and concluding remarks and reflection here. So the first thing is is here is that as I say, uh, the relevance test or the re relevance precision is very high, above ninety percent. But we have only appears uh, unsatisfactory below 70% precisions when the predicted precision of public opinions is unknown. So which means when the human and when the machine predicted the, the public opinions is unknown or unclear positions, actually the favor and against position is very high. So which means that this is a, the high leverage or high percent of the error. And of course, the position analysis and sentiment analysis are very different here, as I said earlier right now. Okay, and the second part that could be reflected upon experiments is that extracting public sentiments and positions can also contribute to public policy communication and negotiation by concluding, by conducting further qualitative arguments. And this is what we are doing right now at this point and hopefully the results could be published later. And then, and, and as the big pictures that I'm showing, we have some uh, hybrid or offline and online sources of, of deliberation. And in the online part, we can do the crowdsource annotation and then do the, the machine judgment. And so it calls for further mixed method and interdisciplinary research and practice. So, and, and the more importantly, the results also suggest that more attention should be paid to AI or machine learning transparency and exp explainability. And this is how, this is what we uh, clearly evidence that the, the, the model has some parameters to manipulate, but the parameters are not quite good enough to transparent, to transparently uh, and explainably to the people. So the last discussion here is, is what we call about the challenges and also the opportunities for usually non-tech savvy domain experts and social scientists who strive to collaborate with uh, AI or machine learning tech 
technical experts and contribute to human machine collaboration and also the decision action oriented policy derivations. So the first thing is that we should increase the data volume for training and testing models by online and offline sources of, uh, of data. And also we have some techniques from a machine learning field they call it unsupervised data augmentation that can increase the data volume for training and testing models. And the second part, second point here is that uh, some uh, domain specific, for example, the, the, the subject we are doing in the research is about nuclear waste. And then we are doing, we are trying to kind of test the, the process to another public policy issue is called EID or electronic ID. That was very hard that, uh, last year, I remember in Taiwan. And so we can do the same text annotation by crowdsourcing. So which means we can, if we can do this or, or kind of tra and transfer this to other fields, we can have some coding communities in diverse interests and diverse positions. So this is what we call the, uh, the, the, the boundary spanning collaborations between the, the practice and the research communities. And also more importantly, we would like to open the black box of the artificial intelligence, machine learning or natural language processing, and such as the BERT, a code lab we were using in the study by standardizing the internet public opinions process. Meanwhile, customizing by policy domain communities so uh, we could achieve more transparency and explainability. Okay, thank you for listening. Thank you. It's great to join the session with esteemed colleagues, even if uh, this happens remotely. Uh, my paper today is titled uh, Search It Out Tomorrow, Public Engagement for Real. The uh, main goal of this paper is to reflect on the practices of public engagement in Taiwan uh, through the recent case of uh, Search It Out. Uh, what I will do uh, today is to first present the narrative and then come back to the paper itself uh, and uh, along with the key findings and uh, reflection. Zhezhidao, for those who are not uh, familiar with this part of Taipei, uh, it's currently a, a peninsula located at the confluence of Qilong and Thames River, where as you can see in the bubble on the screen. In the 1970s, due to concern about frequent flooding, a construction moratorium was imposed on the area resulting in this current state as one of the least developed uh, quote unquote parts of the city. Uh, because of the construction moratorium, the local property owners have not been able to rebuild or renovate their properties for over a half century. Uh, this has been one of the key challenges and forms of injustice uh, in the area. However, uh, the moratorium at the same time also meant that many parts of Sussex today uh, seem frozen in time, such as this traditional courtyard house, uh, one of few that remains today in Taipei, as well as agriculture, uh, which has played a, a historically important role uh, in Sussex before. Uh, transportation make it easier uh, to ship produce from outside Taipei. Uh, Sussida has been uh, providing fresh vegetables uh, to the city. And today it is still an active area uh, for farming. Not to mention natural habitats for migratory birds and many uh, other species of wildlife. Uh, in recent years, however, uh, Sussida has been uh, faced with many challenges, including the encroachment of industries, uh, waste facilities, uh, and outside businesses that set up warehouses and logistics centers. Developers have been buying properties in the area in anticipation of future developments once the uh, moratorium is lifted. Uh, another key challenge, although others may uh, see this as an opportunity uh, that uh, Suzidao is facing today, it is uh, the plan for uh, redevelopment initiated by the city uh, government under the current mayor of Kerwins. In an effort to speed up the uh, redevelopment process, uh, the city under Mayor Cole 
uh, was uh, was recently uh, was newly elected uh, at the time. Uh, wrote out a uh, was uh, the so-called I voting system, an online polling uh, platform for citizens to decide on alternatives provided by the city in this uh, case. From the i-voting process, uh, the eco uh, syntax alternative received the most vote at around uh, 60% uh, from the local community. Uh, even though the uh, voter turnout was only about 35%, uh, the city figured that it had the mandate uh, from the voters to move forward uh, with this project. And that precisely has been a major source of con uh, contention uh, between the pro-development faction in the community and those who are opposed to the plan. Uh, here is a picture of familiar scenes uh, in uh, the community whenever there is a meeting or events concerning the uh, development. Uh, the two uh, groups and their uh, supporters will show up to engage in protests and counter protests. With the perceived though uh, contested uh, mandate, uh, the city proceeded with formalizing the eco alternative uh, into a new general plan uh, for the area. As you can see, uh, it will uh, dramatically alter the historical fabric of the area, uh, not to mention uh, homes of those uh, whose family have lived there for uh, generations. This is uh, the timeline for development. I didn't have uh, time to translate or uh, to get into the detail, unfortunately, but basically, uh, despite the protest and uh, contestation, uh, the project has already moved through multiple rounds of review. Uh, including the recent approval of the environmental impact assessment, uh, even though the approval is now being contested in court uh, by the opposition. In September and October of last year, 2021, uh, with uh, just a little more than a year left in Mayor Coe's uh, term, uh, the, and uh, alongside the continued uh, conflict in the community, the city decided to make a last ditch effort uh, to reach out to the community again in hopes of resolving those conflicts. Uh, this would involve uh, organizing a series of stakeholder workshop over uh, two weekends on September 26th and October 3rd uh, that serve as uh, one of the, the focal uh, kind of material for uh, the paper. The workshop was spearheaded by the uh, so-called Citizen Participation uh, Commission, uh, a task force established by the city and chaired by the mayor himself. A uh, consultant in this case uh, was asked to uh, design and organize the workshop, uh, who in turn uh, recruited many of the leading community engagement experts uh, in the city to serve as table captain uh, or facilitators. Uh, for full disclosure, I was actually one of the facilitators who uh, were recruited for the workshop. The workshop was organized in a uh, sort of war cafe uh, style with uh, participants moving through a series of uh, tables assigned uh, with different themes ranging from environmental improvements to resettlement uh, to economic revitalization. Uh, this was the, uh, what you're looking at here is the table assignments for uh, the uh, September 26th uh, workshop. The format for uh, the, uh, the second day uh, was similar but simplified to allow for uh, the staff to make a uh, sort of overview in the beginning, apparently uh, many of the participants, uh, that this is something we, we found out in the first uh, set of workshop, uh, were now fully aware of the current content of the development plan. Uh, so that uh, changes may. 
This was the crowd in uh, front of the uh, local school that served as the venue for the workshop. Uh, because of COVID, uh, the number of participants was capped. Uh, the stakeholders, uh, basically the residents and property owners, had to uh, enter a lottery to be selected. Uh, so it's not, you know, it's not something that is so open-ended uh, for the community to participate. Uh, here are some of the activities during the workshop. Uh, uh, participants in this particular picture were asked to identify uh, and locate issues and assets in the community from uh, their knowledge and perspective. A lot of sticky notes, uh, the participants seem very uh, comfortable with this particular methods of engagement. Uh, there was one group in which uh, participants had to draw uh, the future vision of their home. And uh, so for the most part, the uh, folks who were at the workshop were really uh, engaged and cooperative. Uh, these are some of the outcomes from one of the groups. Uh, here, the participants were concerned not just with the issues of development, but also about uh, education and other social economic issues facing the community. The staff from the consultant's firm uh, were there uh, to take notes as well to capture uh, you know, the conversation. Uh, so despite the escalating tensions surrounding the project, the workshop themselves seemed rather calm and ran quite smoothly without a hitch. Uh, there were very few, if any, uh, verbal uh, sort of conflict among the opposing sides of uh, the issue. Uh, later, we found out that uh, it was the case because uh, the participants sort of self-sorted uh, or self-organized themselves uh, into uh, groups which share uh, kind of opinions. And uh, there, there was, uh, nevertheless, there were some kind of really thoughtful exchanges, but for the most part, the participants have sort of stuck to their prescribed uh, opinion, which sort of defeated the purpose of the workshop, uh, despite uh, 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 the fact that, you know, I think we still gather some really important insights uh, from the participant. Uh, so at the end of the workshop, participants from each group will come up and present the findings. Uh, so there were opportunities to compare notes. Uh, and uh, as one of the facilitators of myself, I came away with a much more uh, nuanced understanding and appreciation of the issues at hand. So what have been the outcome and impact of the workshop? It turned out that the workshop was sort of the, the calm before the storm, uh, just a few weeks after the workshop, before the city was able to respond uh, substantively to the outcome of the workshop. Uh, Mayor Cole, who is uh, known for being prone to, uh, uh, to gaffes, uh, said that uh, he had no choice but to crush the opposition, uh, Nian Guoxu. Uh, the opposition exploded at that moment, and any remaining trust and working relationship uh, between the city and the opposition had evaporated. Since then, the city did continue to move the project forward. Uh, so this is uh, sort of an uh, abbreviated version of the narrative. Uh, and let me come back to the paper, as I mentioned in the beginning, I'm interested in reflecting upon the practices of citizen uh, uh, participation and public engagement in Taiwan through the case of Susan Dao. Therefore, uh, the paper began with an overview of the literature on public engagement in Taiwan, focusing on applications and continued challenges. Uh, it then present the background uh, of Susan Dao uh, and account of the I voting process as well as the stakeholders workshop. Uh, in terms of uh, findings, first of all, uh, the methods uh, and techniques uh, seem sound on their own uh, and they appear to be quite effective in engaging the participants as evident uh, in the workshop. Uh, but they were either uh, too early or too late. The I voting process in particular took place without sufficient 
consultation with the community to generate the alternatives. The workshop, on the other hand, happened too late and uh, it had no kind of substantive impact on the planning process itself that has uh, basically kind of moved beyond the initial outreach and consultation stage. Uh, in other words, we have a case of disjointed uh, methods and process. Uh, secondly, despite the appearance of participation through both iVoting and stakeholder workshop, as well as many uh, community and public meetings, the actual impact of these uh, engagement appear to be very limited. Uh, even as recently as the workshop, which took place six years after the project was uh, launched, uh, many in the community still do not have uh, a full understanding of the development plan and potential impact on the community. Also, the level of participation seemed rather rudimentary. Uh, with I voting, uh, for instance, citizens only got to pick among the options provided by the city. There was no uh, negotiation or consensus building to arrive at a, a negotiated outcome. Uh, and uh, this is what I mean by uh, limited participation. Lastly, despite instances of public engagement, the current planning process for Citadel is still largely a technocratic exercise, uh, reflecting a top-down power structure and uh, with a focus on following the prescribed bureaucratic procedure for approval. The engagement activity that follow more to fulfill the uh, procedural requirements than to ensure that the proposed plan uh, met the needs and aspirations of the community stakeholders. Even if opportunity for participation uh, were present, uh, they were made possible at the discretion of the political administrative leadership. Uh, so I call this the uh, technocratic process in disguise. Uh, to conclude, in a paper published earlier this year in the journal uh, Critical Policy Studies, Busu and others present a concept of embedded participatory governance which they argue is distinct from and prefer over uh, the notion of institutionalized uh, participation, which has uh, been most part uh, uh, the, the, the practices in Taiwan. Uh, for participatory governance to be embedded, uh, they argue that there are two key uh, characteristics. First, there have to be positive relationship among actors, processes, and institutions for productive outcome. Secondly, it has to be a rootedness in the culture and politics of a place. Clearly, the case of search doubt did not meet either of these uh, criteria. So one can argue that it is a case of disembedded uh, participatory governance. But the case of search doubt is not alone. Uh, in this value and limitation when it comes to citizen participation. In fact, many of the fallacies in the case of Sergeant uh, have been present in the literature on uh, the practices of citizen participation and public engagement in Taiwan. Uh, and here is a very uh, short uh, list, you know, ineffective, ineffective notification exclusion from decision making uh, the process, uh, input collected, but unaccounted for, uh, and so forth. Uh, embedded participatory governance present a challenge for Taiwan, which has come a long way uh, since the uh, political system has been liberalized. The case of Sersodok suggests that more work is needed to make democratic participation an embedded practice in local planning and governance in Taiwan. Thank you. So the topic today for my presentation is to look at the citizen power plant in Taiwan. And I have a, a co-presenter, but who is not with us. He, the name is uh, Ding Yun Zhong. He is uh, currently a postdoc fellow at Academia Sinica. So my, my name is Ming Xiao Ho. I'm from uh, the part of Department of Sociology, uh, National Taiwan University. So, uh, 
Oh, thank you. This is uh, the, the overlook of my presentation. So this is a flow. So next, uh, yeah, I can do that. Okay, thank you. Uh, so there are several reasons why we should pay attention to the development of power, uh, power plant in Taiwan. Uh, number one is that uh, it has been a, it has been a government policy to go nuclear free by 2025, and also the government made a commission to go net zero, meaning that we are going to produce zero carbon uh, emission by 2050. Uh, so there has been a need for the uh, uh, growth of the uh, green energy or renewable energy, but so far renewable energy in terms of electricity production has been quite. Uh, insignificant. So by by the year 2020, we have only 5.4% uh, of the electricity coming from the renewables. And for solar panel uh, energy, that the lower the, the percentage is much lower. And secondly, I think uh, citizen uh, uh, sorry uh, citizen power plants are important in 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 that it can help to solve the so-called green to green conflict. Because uh, over the past decade, we have seen many projects against so-called renewable energy projects, whether it's uh, wind turbines, I'm sure, offshore. And also in terms of when it comes to uh, solar energy, because it needs quite a, a, a quantity of land to place the solar panels. So they have been clouding our uh, process that we see that uh, more and more uh, solar farms are taking out existing farmland and ponds and fish farms and so on. So uh, so in, in this context, so the rooftop uh, solar panels have been uh, seen as a solution. And this is the area where major citizen problems are concentrated. And also in the effort that, uh, in, a, in a anticipation that because they are having always, always been a need be practice, meaning that uh, people don't want this uh, electricity generating facility in their in the backyard. So once we have a uh, citizen participation, we could have solved this kind of conflict uh, because the citizen can actually make benefit out of their participation. So there has been many hope on that. And so we actually have a legal definition of so-called citizen power plan, the Kuomintang Dianchang. Uh, it can take many forms. It can be the companies, it can be the co-op, a non-profit organization, or social enterprise, and so on, as long as they meet two criteria. Number one is that the citizen have to invest their money. So the money does not come from, does not just come from institution. The second one is the revenue is shared by the participants and contribute to the local and public service and the public and benefit. Purposes. This this quotation is coming from a white uh, white paper from a Ministry of Energy. So they have been, uh, as I said, anticipated benefit for certain power plant. It can increase the production of renewables. It can enhance the com uh, citizen participation and also empower local communities. And look, on the theoretical front, I want to engage with the so-called uh, social, social technical imagery, which has been a term that has been quite popular among STS communities. In brief, this term uh, call attention to the fact that technology is not just technological, because it comes with a bundle of vision of how the society and community should, should, should work. So uh, technologies always have this uh, potential to remake the new societies. So since the 70s, since the introduction, since the invention of this uh, renewable energies, primarily solar panels, at that time it was pretty much pre preliminary uh, in terms of technology, but 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 still at the time, people have many high hope. So people were envisioning a, 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 a society that is decentralized, that everyone can uh, contribute to the production of energy. So we don't have to rely on some monopolies that connect the, uh, the a different territory with the national grid. 
So, uh, yeah, and also in, in, the, in the case of Germany and Japan, they have been uh, buttoning up activism to promote the renewables. In Germany, it originated from the 70s anti-nuclear protest. In Japan, it has to do with the 2011 Fukushima incident. So, new renewables have been uh, seen as a strategy to revitalize those uh, disaster-stricken area. And this is also the theoretical uh, uh, literature we want to engage with, especially in those literature based in European experience. They oftentimes, the, the term is used is here a community renewable energy. So you look at a process and outcome. Process means that whether well, citizen can really participate in the management uh, or it was in trust to a group of professional management. And the outcome means the use of the energy developer, whether it was consumed locally or it was connected with in the national grid to distribute it to the end user that in the distance. This is a European uh, uh, experience. So what I'm going to do here in my paper is to develop a locally based framework to look at the full panoply of Taiwan citizen power plants. So, uh, so we have been looking at six cases here in Taiwan. So they are quite diverse. Some are based in Taipei and some are based in, in, in Taitung or offshore island. So we'll go through with these six cases. So this is an overlook. So the number one SGCE uh, is actually located in Danzui. And the second one, uh, people power is called Su Ming actually located in New Taipei City. Uh, the third one, Green Edible case, is uh, a co-op that originates from a homemaker foundation, Zhu uh, Fu Mo. And the, the fourth one is, is based in Jia Yi Darling, and it was formed as a co-op. The fifth one, Taroma, is actually a, a, a tribal community of Paiwan Zhu, um, located in Taitung County. And the last one to look at is uh, also a co-op based in Jinmen. And that was uh, funded by some of the professors in National Jinmen University. So this is the overlook. So you can see the location and starting year and whether they are involved in social movement. And also we have a survey of the, the capital and also the number of participants here. So, um, so we are looking at how the, the internal differences is. So number one area to look at is how do they define participation? So they are cases that, uh, that practice a more restrictive policy, means that the participant not only have to pay money, but also they have to receive certain education in order to make sure that they have full understanding of the mission of renewables. But on the other hand, there are some organizations that practice unrestricted policy, meaning that as long as you are willing to contribute money, you will be a member. So you see the variety layer. Uh, second area is that how do they regard their energy uh, production? Well, uh, commercialization is good thing. So again, we see a different varieties. Like, for example, the people power, zooming actually is, has a kind of a social, it's a very bottom up organization and emphasize its quest organization uh, orientation. So it actually has a kind of a criticizing, a criticism on the growth ideology. And the fourth one like Taroma, as I said, is based on indigenous communities. So the number one issue for, for is an enterprise is for the tribal self-sufficiency rather than energy and, and other consideration. So they are different varieties. So the, the, the bottom uh, figure try to uh, present the, the main diversity. Um, on the left hand side, you see the pragmatic approach, meaning that they were more interested in production. And, and on the left hand side, you see more emphasis have been put on participation, meaning that people were there not just to be an investor, they need to uh, learn something and do some participation. And, and in the middle, we see uh, like SGC and Green Edible kind of in the middle. So we have main, two main approaches. And this is the, the uh, 
the connection uh, of these six cases. So some of the cases, some of the uh, cases were actually involved in social movement, meaning that they mobilized a member for a number of protests. And some of the cases also have uh, established a collaboration with uh, environmental or anti-nuclear organization uh, supported by a social movement organization. And, and also some of the cases were supported by Community Development Association, Social uh, Chihui. And these are not really social movement oriented, but more geared toward community goods. And also some of the cases actually uh, have been actively supported by Tao Thai power company and uh, especially in the Jinmen case because it's an offshore island and the Thai power company has to maintain a separate fire-based power plant so the like, official have been trying to encourage local leaders to set up uh, independent energy sources and that's why they, we have this Jinmen renewables and some of them will quite rely on commercial service for energy service com uh, cooperation and some of them saw the involvement of academics. So you see, um, generally speaking, uh, cases on the right hand side is more geared towards social movement. So they have more collaboration with an institutionalized actor. Whereas uh, association on the left hand side is more kind of establishing, is, is working with established actors in the field. So I come to a conclusion, as I said, uh, I think one of the uh, main area of difference is that whether these cases saw themselves as social movement. If so, I think they would tend to uh, practice a participatory approach, meaning that they were more emphasizing on the grassroots input. input. If not, uh, the other orientation is more pragmatic, meaning that they were looking toward to uh, maximizing the economic benefit. And for those who adopt pragmatic approach, they were more comfortable with the public-private partnership. So, Thai power company, local government, uh, energy service corporation would be the ideal alliance for these endeavors. So, uh, our survey does uh, indicate that organization resources matter. That's how uh, these uh, different power citizen power plants will will diverge in the very beginning. And one of the, our findings actually is quite encouraging because even though we see the main uh, difference in orientation, but two organizations in the middle, the, the Green Advocate and SGC, actually are the, those who have more members and more installed capacities. So uh, these are also connected with NGO, the first one being Homemaker Union, as I, as I said before, the second is more based on a local community organization as done to the cultural foundation. So these two has so far has shown the more, most promising potential of scaling up. And I so so the, the conclusion is kind of, is kind of uh, uh, we have a kind of uh, optimistic conclusion, meaning that even though there are ideological differences, but they don't really uh, stand in the way of scaling up, which is the urgent which has the potential to meet the urgent energy need for Taiwan. So uh, I probably don't have much time, but I'll go over a, a picture. This is a homemaker union, and they will try to uh, implementing energy education, show you how to make efficient use of a refrigerator, and also how uh, on the right-hand side, you see a, a bicycle, a, a treadmill that you can uh, know how much effort is needed to produce one kilowatt. And this is uh, one of the cases I mentioned, Jai Darin. It started with a local community movement and now move on to a citizen power plant. So prior to that, they had been engaged with in a number of community beautification uh, project and also ecological education. And that's why they have this kind of experience and then move forward to energy production. And the last case, as I say, is in Taidong Taroma, is an indigenous community. So this is uh, the, the tribal area. And on the right hand side, actually, it's a, uh, it's a, a, a v, two vehicles that are based on solar energy and battery. That's how the community activists are were using and they take tourists to, uh, with, on this uh, vehicle to site for sightseeing purposes. So 
uh, so the, 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 in addition to energy production, they were also involved in a number of community revitalization uh, projects. So I'll, I'll end my presentation here. So thank you very much for your listening. So I stop here. Cool, thank you. Uh, so, uh, hi, um, uh, I, 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 I am Richard Boyachko Bo from, from, from Cinema and Media Studies uh, at the University of Washington. I'm a P, 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 PhD candidate currently living in Taiwan um, uh, as I finished my, my uh, my, my dissertation, and um, I'm going to be presenting on uh, the garbage planet uh, um, or the lessons that we can uh, take from 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 Taiwan's way, way, waste management practices as we are uh, 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 as we're trying to uh, deal with the, with with the with the environmental crisis and. Um, uh, we, I, 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 I feel lucky to have uh, uh, to be on the same panel as Nancy Sigai, who, who, who presented first uh, this panel, because um, um, uh, what I'm going to say basically relates to uh, uh, her project, and 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 uh, she's been a, a uh, important source. So um, um, let's see. Um, in 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 his introduction to the Taipei Taipei Biennial 2020 held at the Taipei Fine Arts M M Museum, the noted French sociologist Bruno Latour and co-curator of the exhibition suggested that. That, that when it comes to the current global and environmental crisis, Taiwan is a scale model of the world at large. Although he did not specify how, how exactly that's the case, it is easy enough to, to see parallels. Like on the whole planet, um, as 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 uh, as as a planet, I guess. Um, uh, ta Taiwan also shows a sharp, di sharp divide between the levels of consumptions of the urban dwellers, uh, and and uh, um, on the other hand, of the rural residents and indigenous peoples, um, who who. Who nevertheless suffered the, the the brunt of the of climate related disasters, and just like in in, in the world at large, Taiwan must deal with ever increasing amount of garbage and other types of pollution, um, and which is. Uh, uh, something, the, something that the island <laughs> has handled admirably, um, uh, as as the many recent news reports um, from 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 the world's leading newspapers can attest to. Um, as an island nation, moreover, Taiwan is also. A, 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 particularly vulnerable to sea level rise and extreme weather from, from climate change. So all of these competing relationships make Taiwan an effective place to study not only the causes of global warming, but also the effect the climate change already has on, on, on many parts of the global south and increasingly in the global north as well. And uh, so 
one of the kind of thought experiments that I would like to uh, entertain um, in this presentation is um, we tend to think of uh, the uh, of one of the primary causes of of of, of the current ecological crisis is, is being being overconsumption uh, but really the 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 most immediate immediate reason for global warming is is an excess of greenhouse gases or or what could be could be called greenhouse gas pollution so um really it's 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 not uh it's not overconsumption per se whether of material goods or or hydrocarbons but rather overproduction of waste that is the 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 uh, uh, main culprit so um as as we try to think about uh, how to deal with, with the anthropogenic global global warming um would it be useful to think of it in terms of 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 waste management and uh what what makes uh, Taiwan particularly suitable uh, in in this in this respect um, as a, a case study is that uh, uh, it has ha it has uh, uh, lived through a a a a waste man a waste management crisis in in the nineteen eighties. And nineteen in nineteen nineties that had earned it um, uh, the, the the unflattering moniker of garbage island, uh, and 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 through uh, effective uh, policies, uh, uh, citizen activism, uh, like the the like the homemaker, like the like the homemakers union that um, uh, Dr. Ho has talked about um, Taiwan was able to 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 solve the waste management and the issues and 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 now uh, uh, in the past few 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 years more and more international newspapers have been uh, uh, praising uh, how, how well it has uh, um, it, it has done so but um and uh so in 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 her, in her exploration of, of taiwan's musical garbage trucks <laughs> Nancy guys suggest that having to engage with with waste disposal on a daily basis, especially since the garbage trucks play a melody that is hard to ignore, um, uh, uh, has allowed the Taiwanese residents to develop a a a a, a higher uh, 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 awareness both of of waste generation in particular as well as um, uh, the larger uh, environmental problems and so uh, i am wondering if perhaps we in the united states uh, uh, the country that is the world's largest proof reduce plastic waste and other kinds of waste um, uh, might be uh, benefit from a similar garbage consciousness that 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 guy spoken uh, spoke 
and wrote about. And um, I am going to uh, cut my presentation not shorter than um, I uh, I had meant it to be, uh, and I uh, was going to 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 add to uh, um, to what uh, Lindsay Guy to uh, uh, in terms of uh, 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 cultural products uh, that 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 kind of deal with. Um, with garbage and and uh, musical garbage and uh, and and musical garbage shocks, but um, I am going to skip that part and 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 just to flip through the slides. Um, uh, let's see. In uh, but the basic idea. Yeah. Is is that just like the, just like there have been songs um, that feature garbage, which is like not something that you would expect in um, in 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 cultural works, really, uh, and which makes uh, Taiwan again unique. Um, there are also so 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 so, so TV shows and uh, and uh, animated films that kind of feature garbage recycling uh, and 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 waste like deal with uh, waste. Um, but what I wanted to kind of to focus on in the, the remaining few minutes that I have is what. Um, if if as 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 guy mentioned it is the kind of daily uh, uh, practice of 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 going to the uh, uh, to 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 dump one's garbage um, um one once you you hear the uh, the garbage uh, the garbage truck music. Um, I I feel like uh, since I've been living in Taiwan the, the, the past year, I, I while I do see um, all the residents still still do that and 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 uh, still uh, uh, have a active. Communal experience of 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 um, uh, disposing of of their sorted garbage. Um, I feel like looking at the kind of young uh, at 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 younger residents, in, in like their teens through their through their through their thirties. It seems like uh, um, the convenience culture for that 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 Taiwan imported from 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 Japan and South Korea has permeated the culture so much that uh, uh, it's it, it is now way too 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 easy to uh, go through your your day and. And and use the uh, single use packaging, uh, uh, and and uh, excuse me, um, and 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 not really pay, pay attention to uh, to the garbage that 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 you generate. Uh, pardon me. If the present like level of 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 um, uh, convenience that that we can see uh, in, in Taiwan, where where um, where people don't really have to think about garbage anymore, don't have to uh, uh, sort garbage while they're out. Um, uh it 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 whether it 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 basically removes the kind of the garbage consciousness that has made uh 
the ones waste management are successful. Uh, so in other words, um, does it make sense to think of of of, of uh, or, or like to to base waste management policies on um, uh, on the idea that perhaps things should not be convenient things should 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 still have some uh, some tension some 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 um uh, some friction to kind of to to uh help people notice uh the amount of garbage that they generate uh, okay so um i think um uh, this is a good stopping point. So they thank you for your attention and um, I look forward to uh, the, the, the Q&A session.